On October 18th, 2013, Canadian Prime Minister Harper and EC President, European Commission President Barroso, reached an agreement in principle on the Canada-US Comprehensive Economic Trade Agreement. This marked a historic moment for both Canada and the EU and a major milestone in the evolution of the relationship. CEDA has the potential to create vast new opportunities between Canada and across the European Union, including our country, Greece. It can open new markets for exporters, it can generate high quality jobs for workers, and forge closer links between the two economies. The CETA agreement in principle can also be viewed as a watershed moment in the development of the 21st century framework for trade. Never before have two highly developed economies reached an agreement encompassing the full range of factors that now shape trade in the global economy. They are liberalization in the trade of, in the trade of goods and services, comprehensive and balanced protection for intellectual property, access to procurement opportunities at all levels of government, cooperation on regulations and product standards, support for sustainable development, and the list can go on. As a result, CETA sets a new standard for the trade agreements for the 21st century, including the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, now under negotiation between the United States and the EU. CETA, therefore, represents a high watermark in the history of Canadian-European relationship and a major step towards the shared effort to advance global prosperity through free trade and open markets. When CETA comes into force, it will be the most comprehensive agreement ever between the EU and a free trade agreement partner country. For Canada, the CETA is its most ambitious trade initiative ever. Broader in scope, even than NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, an indicative of a shared commitment to strengthening trade, economic ties with key partners in order to advance stability, growth, and sustainable prosperity for the global economy. As I mentioned earlier, tonight we have two distinguished guests, His Excellency Ambassador Robert Peck, and Professor Passaris, who will address CETA from a diplomatic, first, as well as an academic economic angle. Let me introduce our first speaker, Ambassador Peck. Robert Peck was born in Montreal, Canada, and studied history and journalism at Concordia University. Upon graduation, he served in the House of Commons as one of the 10 parliamentary interns selected from across Canada. He joined the Canadian Foreign Service in 1982 and served in Ottawa, followed by assignments as the Canadian High Commission in Lagos, Nigeria, and the Canadian Embassy in Bern, Switzerland. At headquarters, Mr. Peck worked in corporate management, personnel, and the media relations office. In 2011, Mr. Peck was appointed as Ambassador of Canada to the Hellenic Republic, as well as High Commissioner the Republic of Cyprus. Ambassador Peck is married to Maria Padazi Peck, who's also an officer in the Canadian Foreign Service and with us tonight as well. Ambassador Peck. <clears throat> Distinguished guests, Provost Fleuris, ladies and gentlemen, students, friends of Canada and Greece. It's a real pleasure to be with you tonight to speak about Canada-Greece relations, both a look back, some thoughts about relations today, and opportunities going forward. Let me start by saying that despite the challenges Greece's face, Greece faces today and the impact of the economic crisis on hardworking Greek citizens, I do not consider myself to be what I call an Alino pessimist. In fact, I believe there is now a unique opportunity for Greece to embrace a new future. In May 2011, on his first trip abroad, after winning a majority government, Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper headed for Greece. And this was not a visit to sign bilateral agreements or commercial deals. 
With then Prime Minister George Papandreou at his side, he boarded a helicopter and flew to the village of Calavrita and the site of the ancient monastery of Aia Lavra, a wellspring of rebellion, as many of you know, against Greece's 19th century Ottoman overlords, but also home to more recent memories. On a chilly December morning in 1943, occupying troops from Nazi Germany rounded up the town's men, marched them up a nearby hill, and cut them down with machine guns, killing almost 500 men, including eight monks, torn from their prayers and meditations. Prime Minister Harper said, quote, these are things we must never forget, even as we move forward together, a theme of my remarks tonight. Prime Minister Harper's visit to Calavrita, the first by a foreign head of government, echoes many of the central themes in Canada's long and close relationship with Greece. Forged in war and Cold War and honed during a lingering era of global unrest, which unfor unfortunately continues today, this transatlantic partnership joined two distant countries and disparate peoples in a shared struggle for freedom, democracy, and prosperity. 70 plus years in our diplomatic relations, my remarks, I hope, will attest to a record of perseverance in the service of friendship. Canada-Greece relations stretch back to 1899 when the first Greek Consul General arrived in Montreal, my hometown. But early bilateral ties were tenuous and insignificant. By 1931, there were still just 9,444 Greek immigrants scattered across Canada, and the total trade between the two countries was negligible. Relations changed suddenly and forever in the spring of 1941 when Hitler's Nazi Germany marched south through the Balkans and defeated Greek and British Commonwealth forces allied in defense of freedom. Greek leaders fled the mainland, formed a government in exile in Egypt, and reached out for many friends. And they found one in Canada. In June 1942, Greece opened a mission in Ottawa to strengthen the bonds which, quote, united the Greek and British imperial forces on the battlefield, un unquote. Canada, which had gone to war at Britain's side in September 1939, quickly reciprocated. In November 1942, Prime Minister W.L. Mackenzie King appointed one of Canada's most senior diplomats and future Governor General. Governor General in Canada is the representative of the Queen of Canada, who happens to be also the Queen of England, Major General Georges Vanier, minister to the Greek government in exile. Canadians rallied to Greece's side during the Second World War. Communities across the country backed the Greek War Relief Fund and sent a stream of supplies through the Canadian Red Cross. In 1942, the Canadian government began shipping 15,000 tons of wheat monthly through neutral Sweden to stave off starvation in occupied Greece. Canada's, Canada's support for the suffering Greek population was underpinned by Prime Minister King's romantic view of Greek heroism. When Greek King George II visited Canada in July 1942 with Prime Minister Emmanuel Tsouderos at his side, the Canadian leader praised him lavishly for his bravery, thanking him for, quote, resisting Hitler in the old world, unquote. By the end of the war, over $3 million worth of Canadian aid had poured into Athens, one of the largest fund, relieving, fund relief efforts in, in, uh, abroad during that time. The transatlantic link between the two countries was further strengthened when Canada returned the new Greek Prime Minister, George Papandreou, father, and his government in exile to the native land aboard a Canadian ship, the HMCS Prince David landing them at the port of Pirea in October of 1944 to a tremendous welcome. Canada's aid to Greece during the Second World War would not be forgotten. The post-war relationship was closer still. During the summer of 1945, the two countries raised the status of their diplomatic missions to full-fledged embassies. And one of my eminent predecessors, Major General L.R. Lafleche, headed the new Canadian mission in Athens. Lafleche was a strong appointment a French-Canadian veteran of the First World War and a skilled administrator. Prime Minister King paid close attention to Lafleche's dispatches from Athens. When informed of plans to rename city streets in Athens in honor of Prime Minister King to celebrate Canada's contribution to Greece's liberation, King confided to his diary that, quote, this was the greatest honor of the many that have been bestowed in the course of my public life, unquote. 
In 1947, King's name resplendently carved on marble and lettered in gold was placed on one of Piraeus's main streets to celebrate, quote, the Canadian who in his own right and as personifying Canada is recalled even more vividly than ancient Zeus, unquote. Quite, quite a tribute. We recently inaugurated Canada Park in Platea Hagia Sophia in Thessaloniki to celebrate this wartime solidarity. It is located just opposite the last remaining street in Greece named after King, Odos Mackenzie King. Some of you from Thessaloniki may know exactly where, where it is. Ambassador the Flesh also tracked the continued flow of Canadian aid, including food, medical supplies, and millions of items of clothing to Greek civilians trapped in the bloody civil war between communists and non-communist partisans that erupted in 1946. King, like most Canadians, watched with horror as the Soviet Union's communist allies threatened Western Europe's fragile post-war democracies. Canadian diplomats agreed, and when the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, was created in 1949 to confront the communist threat in Europe, they welcomed Greek membership in 1952. Canada and Greece had become formal allies in the fight for European democracy. Post-war immigration also strengthened bilateral ties. Impressed by Greek heroics during the Second World War and inspired by the democratic ideals of ancient Greece, Cold War Canada welcomed a wave of Greek immigrants. In the decade between 1951 and 1961, 35,000 Greeks emigrated to Canada. They settled mainly in Toronto and Montreal, where they created lively and vibrant neighborhoods that changed the very nature of those cities. A longtime Toronto reporter and local celebrity recalled in his memoirs how, quote, the newcomers brightened up streets by planting flower beds and building pergolas for their grapes. They brought music and a sense of style that was new to their new city, unquote. In so-called Toronto the Good, long derided for its uptight white Anglo-Saxon Protestant culture, Greek residents in Tavernas spilled onto the sidewalks of Danforth Avenue, signaling an era of urban revival. The immigrant wave continued unabated in the 1960s when a further 65,000 Greeks, many of them family members of those that had arrived in the 50s, arrived on Canadian shores. The new arrivals embraced their new home but remained devoted to maintaining their religion, language, and ethnic identity, passing to their children through language schools and regional associations, and keeping alive the ties to the native land. In the late 1950s, the Canadian Minister of Trade and Commerce visited Athens to invigorate commercial relations between Canada and Greece. Armed with a fiery temperament and a strong sense of honor, arn, honor rather, the veteran of both world wars, the minister, was an ideal emissary to southeastern Europe. In his own gruff manner, he impressed Greek officials who welcomed a deepening of the relationship. In April 1961, Greek Prime Minister Konstantin Karamanlis paid a three-day visit to Ottawa to promote the Canada-Greece relationship and establishing a high-level dialogue over important political, economic, and immigration issues. Canada's diplomats were delighted and assured our government that the Greek Prime Minister's visit was prompted by, quote, sincere friendship and close cooperation based upon a community of ideals, of civilization, and of political interests, unquote. The easy and harmonious partnership of the post-war period, however, ended suddenly in the spring of 1967, when Greek military officers seized power amidst a climate of political instability. Handling the new regime was a real challenge for the Canadian government of the day, which found it difficult to strike the right balance between supporting Greek democracy and Canada's broader political interests in this Mediterranean country. Caught in this complex situation, one of my predecessors, the Canadian ambassador in Athens, Herbert Fever, mocked the new junta's regime's, quote, ridiculous attacks on miniskirts and beatnik long hair, while grimly noting the junta's mounting human rights abuses. Despite these concerns, Fever insisted that Ottawa back the new government as part of Canada's Cold War strategy of keeping Greece an effective partner in NATO and conscious of the importance that there is from the military, economic, and political points of view to provide for the continuance of good relations with Greece, unquote. Reconciling good relations with the military junta and Canada's democratic principles proved much more difficult than it looked. By 1968, Canadian officials were frequently pressed by Greek Canadians anxious to help fellow Greeks imprisoned by the regime. In turn, the Greek embassy in Ottawa asked Prime Minister uh, Pierre Trudeau's government to take action against Greek dissidents visiting Canada, a request Canadian officials rejected. 
Indeed, Toronto would soon become a hotbed of democratic opposition to the junta. In 1969, the exiled socialist politician Andreas Papandreou arrived at York University, assuming the Osler Hammond lectureship in economics. In time, he became a close friend of Canada's prime minister, the progressive Pierre Elliott Trudeau, the two men united by their scholarly backgrounds and their profound attachment to liberal democracy. Papandreou used the freedom he enjoyed in Canada to protest loudly against the Greek regime. And along Toronto's Danforth Avenue, in small cafes like the Trojan Horse, Greek Democrats dreamed and sang. Growing international criticism of the Greek junta added to the strain on Canada-Greece relations. By the fall of 1969, the Greek regime was charged with frequently violating human rights and engaging in acts of torture against its civilian population. Within a year, Greece had been suspended from the Council of Europe. Canada rejected similar protests that called for Greece's suspension from NATO. However, standing by Athens was getting tougher all the time. Canadian officials bristling at having to deny the celebrated composer Mikis Theodorakis the chance to write music for a stage production in Stratford, where we have a very well-known uh, Shakespearean festival, in response to official Greek protests. The Canadian government basically could no longer withhold comment on Greek affairs and was forced to act in the spring of 1970, given the human rights violations occurring in Greece and the Greek government's failure to suppress them. Canada's criticism infuriated the military junta, resulting in a period of considerable strain between the two nations, punctuated by sniping, mutual condemnation, and bitterness. Greece's restored democracy proved strong and robust. In 1981, Andreas Papandreou took over the government of Greece at the helm of the Panhellenic socialist movement, PASOK. Prime Minister Trudeau was delighted at his old friend's success, but officials in the Department of Foreign Affairs looked on darkly. They worried about Papandreou's public rejection of the European Economic Community and NATO, his strong anti-American views, and the strain these might place on bilateral relations. But on assuming power, Papandreou would temper his positions on those questions. More important, his personal affection for Canada reinforced relations between the two countries. In March 1993, Prime Minister Papandreou traveled to Canada, visiting Montreal, Quebec City, Toronto, and Ottawa. He was showered with honors. In Quebec City, the Greek Prime Minister was awarded the Medal of the National Assembly, the Quebec Parliament. Toronto Mayor Art Eggleton welcomed Papandreou, quote, on his triumphant return to his home away from home, unquote and York University granted him an honorary doctorate for his accomplishments as a politician and educator. Tens of thousands of cheering Greek Canadians gave the Prime Minister a hero's welcome. Papandreou's visit allowed him to reassure Trudeau about his NATO and European policies. Papandreou also shared the enthusiasm of Canadian officials who were keen on advancing Canadian interests in Greece. Eager to demonstrate his strong leadership and determination to secure Greece's prosperity, Papandreou set to work. Rolling up his sleeves, he convinced Canada that the time was right for cultivating a closer economic partnership with Greece, not only through growth in the traditional commercial and tourism sectors, but also via the, developments, the development of the technological sector. In the coming years, Canadian companies engaged to invest in growing Greek markets and the country's expanding infrastructure. The Greek campaign for Canadian investment paid quick dividends as a large number of Canadian companies, including Denison Mines, de Havilland and Bombardier successfully competed for Greek contracts throughout the 1980s. Denison Mines alone invested hundreds of millions of dollars towards petroleum exploration in the North Aegean during this period. These assets continued to, to operate under the Greek company Energean. Other well-established Canadian companies such as Air Canada, CP Air, the Bank of Nova Scotia, and the Royal Bank's Roy Mideast established a physical presence in Greece alongside the investment funds for major infrastructure projects provided by Canadian banks. Closer political and cultural partnerships followed in the wake of Papandreou's emotional return to Canada. Four years later, in October 1997, Melina Mercuri visited Canada. In Ottawa, she signed an agreement to promote cultural exchanges which will do very great things for peace, the quality of life, and the essence of life, Ms. Mercuri said. In Toronto, she touched Canadian hearts. Quote, I'm very enthused, very happy to be in Toronto, she enthused, her dark eyes brimming with tears. It's a city that I, quote, adore. Bilateral relations intensified with the collapse of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the end of the Cold War. The two countries were determined to support the spread of democratic values, 
personal freedoms and free enterprise, all made possible by the end of East-West conflict. Canada-Greece relations remain strong into this century. As always, political and economic ties were buttressed by Canada's thriving Hellenic Canadian community, now in the order of 300,000. Greek Canadians were increasingly part of mainstream culture in Canada and never more successful, uh, represented in politics, business, academia, and the arts. Cultural ties flourished as well. The Canadian Archaeological Institute renamed the Canadian Institute in Greece in 2005 to better reflect the full range of the Institute's interests, continued to function as an unofficial center for Canadian culture. Greek Canadian, Greek Canadian Ion Vores, founder of the Vores Museum, was awarded the Order of Canada in 2009. Vores refers to his museum as Canada House in Pania. Athens and Montreal were declared sister cities in 1997, and the two countries signed agreements for film co-production in 1997 and educational cooperation in 1998. And chairs for Hellenic studies were established at, the un at universities in Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver. Last year, to mark the 70th anniversary of Canada-Greece relations, the Stavros Niarchos Foundation established scholarships at four leading Canadian universities. We also hosted last year the first Canada-Greece-Cyprus University Partnership Forum. We now have eight agreements between Canadian and Greek universities. Despite the physical distance between Canada and Greece, Canadian universities offer quality education, high standards in a safe environment at very competitive cost. Trade and commercial relations kept pace as the two economies grew more complex and interconnected during the first decade of the new millennium. In Ottawa, there was a fresh appreciation for Greece's importance as a bridgehead to the large regional economy of southeastern Europe. Though trade between the two countries fluctuated widely, its trend was slowly upwards. In 2009, Canada's foreign minister headed to Athens to sign a new double taxation agreement, noting that global and financial downturn calls for the lifting of barriers on trade and investment. And there have been positive developments on the investment side. McCain's Alas, a leader in frozen food products, recently celebrated over 20 years in Greece. El Dorado Gold and Mining, one of the largest single foreign investments in decades, with the potential of important economic and spin-offs in Greece at a difficult time. Fairfax of Toronto has invested over 1 billion euros. And PSP Investments via Avia Alliance has a major stake in Athens International Airport, with a clear interest in even further engagement as the Greek government seeks to reduce its stake in the operation. And one of particular interest, which seems to capture the public imagination, seaplanes, which, you might remember, were introduced by a Greek-Canadian entrepreneur some years ago. A new seaplane law championed by the current government, and where there is rare consensus across the political spectrum, now provides a comprehensive legal framework lacking in the past to give foreign investors the confidence they need. Canada makes the best seaplane in the world, and Viking Aviation of Vancouver has a new generation twin otter aircraft that celebrates the best of Canadian aviation know-how. I am proud that a Greek Canadian, who happens to be here tonight, but I won't single him out, is playing a key role in Greece to start a new and visionary seaplane operation with hopes that the first plane will take to the sky this summer. A seaplane network linking Greece's countless islands without airports and limited ferry service will be a boon to tourism, economic development, and growth. More important to my mind is the message of transformation and renewal that the resumption of seaplane operations would convey. In a few moments, we'll, you will learn from an eminent Greek-Canadian under the symbol of the ties that bind our two countries about a new comprehensive free trade agreement between Canada and the European Union, as alluded to by the provost, which provides a unique opportunity for our two countries to broaden and deepen our economic relationship. Greece has been a strong supporter of this agreement, doubly important as the, company, the country emerges from the economic doldrums. In closing, let me say that Canadians have long known of Greece's capacity for rebirth and renewal. On the visit to Calavrita in 2011, mentioned at the beginning of my remarks by Canada's Prime Minister, he not only looked back and paid his respects to the Greek victims of fascism and tyranny, he looked ahead too. As the Greek government struggled to right their economy, devastated by the recession of 2008, Prime Minister Harper made it clear on his visit to Athens that Canada remained nearby to help. Quote, Canada wants to be part of the strong Greek economy which will eventually emerge on the other side of this nightmare, unquote. 
Today, this solidarity continues. And in my work as Canada's ambassador to the Hellenic Republic, I continue to focus on new opportunities, reminding both Greeks and Canadians alike not to lose sight of a glass at least half full and not half empty. Today, as in the past, Canada and Greece, both long-standing allies, continue to move forward together. Merci beaucoup, Thalistopoli. Thank you.